This is our second podcast in our series on nerve tissue and the nervous system. There are a very large number of neurons in humans, something like maybe a billion to ten billion neurons within humans, and these of course can be sensory neurons, motor neurons, or inter neurons. And as you may be aware, the cell body is the trophic center of the neuron. The cell body is where electrical signals are received by dendrites and then electrical signals are carried away from the cell body by way of the axon. Here it's just showing an axon synapsing onto a dendrite on the cell body. We'll talk about this in more detail in a few minutes. We can also talk about the cell body. We can talk about substances like nissel bodies, which are essentially clumps of rough endoplasmic reticulum in the cell body. We can talk about the axon hillock and the initial segment of the axon. This is, of course, where action potentials are generated. If we talk about neurons in the central nerve, system. We talk about oligodendrocytes, which make myelin, which surround the axons to insulate the axons. If we talk about neurons in the peripheral nervous system, we talk about Schwann cells as the cells that myelinate the axons. And we'll talk about these in much greater detail. We talk about the node of Ranvier in uh, muscle. We talk about neuromuscular junctions in the motor end plate. We'll talk about the parts of neurons in detail as we go on. As you may be aware, most neurons have one axon and many dendrites. Neurons are metabolically very active cells. They're secretory cells. As a matter of fact, they're very highly active as secretory cells. The synthetic machinery for secretion is not present in the axon. It is, of course, present in the cell body of the neuron, and it is even present in the dendrites. Neurons are post-mitotic cells, so by and large, they don't divide. There are a couple of exceptions. When we talk about some of the neurons in the taste buds, those are unusual in that they can divide, but by and large, neurons don't divide. But you need to be aware that the organelles of neurons do turn over fairly rapidly, and that turnover of organelles is actually very important for the economy of neuron function. This is just a histological image and an electron microscopic image of some neurons in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. You can see that neurons are very big cells. They have very prominent nuclei with prominent nucleoli. The nuclei that are shown here would be nuclei of supporting cells, satellite cells or glial cells if you want, just supporting cells. Since this is the spinal cord, these would be actually uh, central nervous system supporting cells, so we could call them neuroglial cells. We mentioned the nissel bodies. The nissel bodies are clumps of rough endoplasmic reticulum. At the electron microscopic level, you can see some mitochondria in the neurons. You can see lots of rough ER. You can see some profiles of Golgi. And you can see, if you look very carefully on the electron micrographs, cross-sectional profiles of microtubules. We're going to come to appreciate that neurons have lots of microtubules in them, and that's necessary for the vesicular transport of of organelles down the axon. Well, it turns out that these microtubules will break up the rough endoplasmic reticulum and cause it to clump. And the clumping of that rough endoplasmic reticulum is what we see as nissel bodies at the light microscopic level. Here is another view of a multipolar neuron. You can see the cell body with this uh, punctate type staining. This punctate staining represents the nissel substance. Here's the nucleus and the nucleolus. Here are some profiles of dendrites coming in to this neuron cell body. Here I'm highlighting like so the axon hillock. You can see that in the diagram, the axon hillock. You can see these clumps of nissel substance in the diagram, and although the diagram doesn't label these, you can see these lines on the cartoon are meant to represent the microtubules in the neuron.
we can classify neurons in a variety of different ways. So we can talk about unipolar neurons, bipolar neurons, etc. I want to make a point. Unipolar neurons are not common in higher animals, but we define a unipolar neuron if you were looking at animals like insects, for example, as a neuron with a cell body and one major process coming off that cell body. All these other neurons are, of course, common in higher animals and in humans. So we can talk about a bipolar neuron, two processes, two major processes coming off the cell body, a pseudo unipolar neuron, really one process coming off the cell body that then splits so that it looks like it's more than one pole. These are very common in dorsal root ganglion. The multipolar neuron, which is what we typically see as the majority of neurons in humans, at least, multiple dendrites coming into the cell body and usually one major axon. And then we can talk about some of these pyramidal neurons and Purkinje neurons. These are actually multipolar neurons that are just highly specialized. And we'll talk about them in a little bit later in a different context. Here's another way to look at neurons. We can talk about motor neurons, sensory neurons, and integrative neurons. The integrative neurons usually would be neurons in the central nervous system. But notice in the motor neurons, cell bodies of somatic motor neurons and presynaptic autonomic motor neurons, the cell bodies are in the central nervous system. The postsynaptic neuron, if it's an autonomic neuron, will have a cell body in a ganglion. The somatic motor neuron, the cell body, will be in the central nervous system and it will synapse on its, its effector somewhere out in the body itself. The sensory neurons, mostly the cell bodies of sensory neurons are located outside the central nervous system. They would generally be in ganglia. So a pseudo unipolar neuron, the cell body, would be in a ganglion. Bipolar neurons, these are actually found in the retina very commonly. Well, I guess you would say those neurons, the retina would be within the central nervous system. And then these integrative neurons, pyramidal cells found in regions of the brain, Purkinje cells and other specific regions of the brain. These are integrative neurons found essentially in the central nervous system. Now, the cartoon is just meant to show the direction that impulse would travel. And I think you all appreciate this. But the direction of impulse is always traveling from the cell body, away from the cell body, down the axon. So even in this case, from the cell body of a presynaptic neuron to the dendrites of a postsynaptic neuron, and then away from the cell body of the postsynaptic neuron, down the axon. Here in these pseudo-unipolar neurons, you could say that this portion of the cell process acts like the dendrite. The signal is coming in here, but then it will be traveling towards the cell body, then traveling away from the cell body on this portion, so this portion would act like the axon. In the integrative neurons, just as you might expect, a signal comes in through the dendrites and goes away from the cell body down the axon. Let's compare and contrast dendrites and axons for a few minutes. Dendrites are essentially afferent processes on neurons. They receive information from other neurons or from the environment. Dendrites can be highly branched. They can be tapered. They can show very extensive aberrations, and that's to increase surface area. Dendrites are unmyelinated. The organelle profile in dendrites is similar to that of the cell body, except that you don't find Golgi within dendrites. We can talk about structures that are called dendritic spines. There can be large numbers of dendritic spines within the dendrites of any given neuron. That can allow huge numbers of synapses to individual neurons. And we'll show you some images of that in a few minutes. If we consider axons, axons would be the efferent process coming out of a, a neuron. The length and diameter of axons can vary from axon to axon, but within a given neuron, the diameter of an axon is constant. We talk about the initial segment. That's a segment below the region called the axon hillock. That's where the action potential is generated. We can talk about axonal branching, and we can talk about recurrent branching versus collateral branching. Recur 
concurrent branching is when the axon branches near the cell body, as opposed to collateral branching, the axon branches near its target. Terminal arborizations with synaptic boutons, again increasing area for synapses to form. The axons don't have that many organelles. They do have, of course, a lot of microtubules and intermediate filaments, which are given the name neurofilaments. They do have mitochondria, and they're packed full of vesicles that are involved in transport both away from the cell body and towards the cell body. And we'll look at that a little bit later in our podcasts. Here is a view of the dendritic tree of a neuron. You can see all these little dendritic spines. Here we've got some specific fluorescent stains, essentially a monoclonal antibody to microtubules stained in this orange color or red, and then monoclonal antibodies to microfilaments, highlighting the, the dendritic spines in green, and these dendritic spines are just an area where a synapse can occur. So all these little bumps that you see on the dendrites are potential areas where axons of other neurons can synapse onto these dendrites. And so here's an electron micrographic view of a presynaptic and a postsynaptic area. So this presynaptic would be the axon synapsing onto a dendritic spine. And this is just a diagrammatic view of what the synapse might look like. We will look at synapses in more detail in a, a little bit later. Now axons, of course, can be myelinated as shown in this electron micrograph or unmyelinated as shown in this electron micrograph. The organelle profile axons have of course many microtubules in them and those are highlighted here by the arrows and as I blow up this image you can see these look like microtubules. There are many neurofilaments which are the little smaller profiles that are shown here. There's smooth ER, which is a little bit difficult to pick up in the axons. You can see some mitochondria, and there are vesicles in transport. So you can see these nice vesicles in transport. Here on the myelinated axon, again, you can see the microtubules like so, uh, blowing them up. They clearly look like microtubules. You can see the microfilaments. You can see some profiles of mitochondria, and we'll talk about this myelin sheath a little bit later. This is just another interesting fluorescence micrograph to show the polarity of neurons. So the axons in this image are stained red, the cell body and the dendrites are stained green. So you can clearly see there's a difference in polarity between the axons and the dendrites. Here, special fluorescent stains at the initial segment of the axon. The sodium channels are marked with a red fluorescent stain, and you can see those here. And then green is highlighting a membrane component called ancrin. Now, you may be aware that the sodium channels are necessary to generate the action potential. Ancrin actually helps to cluster these sodium channels in the initial segment of the neuron. This is, of course, very important if this is a myelinated neuron, and we'll talk about why that's the case a little bit later.